that. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the first webinar for this academic year in the Amical Currents uh, webinar series, where we invite speakers on timely issues that bring together interest of the librarians, the technologists, and the faculty at Amical institutions. And just so that everyone is aware, we are recording this webinar, and we will be posting it within the next few weeks um, online when we launch Amical's YouTube channel. Um, and in the recorded version, the, the chat conversation will be visible, but the participant names will be anonymized. So it'll read participant one, participant two, and things like that. Um, so a quick thanks to Dimitris Duris from Anatolia College in Thessaloniki, Greece, who's running the webinar platform today for us, and who is also launching the YouTube channel for us in just a few weeks. Um, and thanks also to Megan Houlihan, who will be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, and Megan, by the way, um, I think most of you know her, but she was um, formerly the coordinator of information literacy at American University in Cairo, and she's now the first year experience and instruction librarian at New York University, Abu Dhabi. So Amical's Professional Development Committee is planning a great series of webinars this year uh, with topics ranging from new information literacies to the digital humanities at international liberal arts institutions. But this first webinar, uh, the first webinar in this year's Amical Current Series is dedicated to the new ACR framework for information literacy, and in particular to one of the pedagogical elements uh, that's underpinning it called threshold concepts. And it was Megan Houlihan, actually, that first put us in touch with our speakers. So I think it's fitting that I let her introduce them. So Megan. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm so pleased that Lori Townsend and Sylvia Liu could join us this morning, afternoon, and evening for this webinar entitled Threshold Concepts and the ACL Framework and Introduction. Lori is an assistant professor and the learning services coordinator for the university libraries at the University of New Mexico. She holds a BA in history from the University of New Mexico and an MLIS from San Jose State University. Sylvia Alou is a reference and social media librarian and assistant professor at LaGuardia Community College, a SUNY institution. She holds a BA in literature and government from Claremont McKenna College, a MLIS from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaigne, Urbana -Champaign, and an MA in English literature from the University of New Mexico. Again, I'm so happy these ladies could join us um, very early in the morning for this. What's going to happen is that you will be able to um, ask questions and comment on anything that they talk about through the chat. They might not get to your question right away, but we will have time for questions at the end. Um, so thank you for taking the time for coming to attend this webinar, and a big thank you to Lori and Sylvia. Hello. <laughs> this is Lori. And uh, we're really happy to be here today, so thank you for uh, inviting us. And uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Megan. Uh, oh, so it is very early for me. It is about 6.33 in the morning right here in New Mexico. Uh, and so I'm still getting going, but hopefully uh, we've got a good presentation for you today. As you heard, I'm at the University of New Mexico, which is a uh, research library, and Sylvia's at a community college. We have two other collaborators who work with us in our research on threshold concepts. Amy Hoffer, who's at Portland State University, and Corey Brunetti, who is at the City College of San Francisco. And we've been working on threshold concepts now together for quite a while, for several years. And though it actually can be a little difficult for us to schedule meetings across three time zones, we really like that we're sort of maintaining this collaborative perspective, especially because two of us come from very large research libraries and uh, two of us come from community colleges. So hopefully those perspectives will be shared today because we have such differing perspectives, even though I think we're teaching fairly similar student populations. And we're hoping to bring you some insights into practicing and using the new ACRL framework for information literacy and potentially using threshold concepts in your work with faculty and graduate and undergraduate students. So we're going to start out with talking about threshold concepts and the theory of threshold concepts. So the first thing we're going to do is go through the theory. Then we're going to look at specific information literacy threshold concepts. And those are threshold concepts that we uncovered in our Delphi study. 
And then we're going to talk a little bit about the new ATRL framework for information literacy. And, and though I'm on the task force for that framework, I'm actually speaking today in my capacity as a researcher and a practicing librarian. And I'm not really representing ATRL, just to get that out of the way. Uh, and then Sylvia is going to spend um, some time talking about threshold concepts in the classroom, uh, including different kinds of activities that you can do and uh, the orientation towards assessment. So let's get started with the theory. So what is a threshold concept? So we're going to start by grappling with the theory of threshold concepts. And we don't expect to fully explain threshold concepts today, but we will offer this sort of review of the basic criteria for threshold concepts, along with a few ideas that maybe help clarify them for you. So this is the basic definition of a threshold concept. And Meyer and Land were the originators of the threshold concept. They're two British researchers. What they are are these core ideas and processes in any discipline that define the discipline, but are so ingrained that they often go unspoken or unrecognized by practitioners. They're the central concepts that we want our students to understand and put into practice, and that encourage our students to think and act like practitioners, so like a biologist or a nurse or an economist. Threshold concepts are the ones that are often the most difficult to grasp, but that a student needs to get in order to progress in his or her learning in the discipline. And there are five definitional criteria that make a concept a threshold concept. So first and most importantly, threshold concepts are transformative. They cause the student to see the class material and the discipline and maybe him or herself and the rest of the world potentially in a different way. This perceptual shift can transform the student. Students see the content through the lens of the practitioner community and maybe adopt the ways of thinking and practicing common to the discipline. Next, threshold concepts are irreversible. Once you learn them, you don't unlearn them. For example, once you see the old lady and the young woman in this picture on the slide, you, don't, you can't go back to where you didn't see one or the other. And so this is a way of explaining why we as teachers sometimes have a little bit of trouble relating to where our students are coming from. Uh, we've been on the other side of the threshold for so long that we kind of can't remember what it was like before we got it. And this is one of the reasons why threshold concepts can actually be a little bit difficult to identify. Threshold concepts are also integrative. So grasping a threshold concept should help the student gather together all the facts and procedural information and make connections that allow them to see the whole they may also be able to apply this new understanding in other areas in their life. Fourth, threshold concepts may be bounded. Now, this is actually an interesting one because information literacy is not a discipline. And I think this has actually caused a, um, probably the, the criteria that has caused the most concern among librarians. Uh, we contend that librarians share a common way of thinking and practicing that we acquire by crossing the thresholds of our discipline, which is information science. So finally, threshold concepts are often troublesome. And the trouble can come in different varieties, but it tends to center around the fact that we're talking about these big transformative concepts that can provoke student anxiety and resistance. So threshold concepts treat students as potential disciplinary practitioners. And in teaching with threshold concepts, we ask students to see the world through our disciplinary lens. So making this explicit can address some of the traditional power imbalances that often arise in educational settings. And we're not insisting that one or another perspective is better or right, but we're introducing the idea that this is how librarians see information, maybe try it on for size. So Meyer and Land spent a lot of ink on the idea of liminality and the liminal space. They define it as a space where the threshold comes into view for the learner, but the learner has not yet passed through it. And so this liminal space is an in-between transitional place. It can be exciting or terrifying, potentially humbling and troubling. It can also be very alienating, but also potentially engaging. And it can be very short or really long. So one thing that it isn't is comfortable. 
So learners move through the liminal space in different ways and at different speeds, but presumably they do not leave the space unchanged. So some of you may be in the liminal space right now regarding threshold concepts. I spent a long time there. And you may understand them. Hi. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm right in the middle of Oh, Thank you. Sorry, I just had a, um, one of the cleaning um, staff here interrupted <laughs> me. Sorry about that. Uh, so some of you may be in the liminal space right now regarding threshold concepts. Uh, so you may understand them one moment, but then the next moment that feeling may feel like it's fled. So that's kind of really common for being in the liminal space. Sorry about that interruption. So one of the wonderful things about threshold concepts <laughs> is that they are both cognitive and affective. The learner emerges from the liminal space a changed person, and they're changed in both ways. First, there's this epistemological change, which is this cognitive shift, the extent to which the student understands a new concept. And the second change is ontological change, and that's the shift in identity a student experiences as they get this inkling of what it's like to look through a particular disciplinary lens. And so here we're talking about the extent to which the student is comfortable thinking I think like a biologist, or I think like a nurse, or I research like a librarian. This means that threshold concepts are both cognitive and effective, which explains the sort of fraught nature of the liminal space, because it's both an intellectual and an emotional experience. So a useful understanding of a group of disciplinary threshold concepts um, is one that I first heard articulated by Craig Gibson, and he's one of the co-chairs of the task force that's creating the new ACRL information literacy framework. And he called our content a network of interconnected understanding. And so if you pass through the liminal space on one, it might help you along in another. And that's to say that this is complex integrative material, and it can't necessarily be taught in this step-by-step -step linear fashion. And also, students often get stuck in the liminal space because such complexity is difficult, and yet you can't dumb it down or simplify it because it doesn't help them move through the threshold. All right, so we're going to hand off now to me, Sylvia, and I want to get into the specific threshold concepts for information literacy. So in our first article, we offered three threshold concepts and seven in our second article. Right now, we're working on a Delphi study to validate the threshold concept approach for information literacy and to identify the actual threshold concepts for information literacy. A Delphi study is a qualitative research method in which a small group of experts are asked to anonymously answer questions about a topic in writing. The answers are all collected, and then they're summarized by a moderator, and then those answers are sent back to the experts. So this process is called a round, and in each round, experts read the responses of their peers, potentially adjust their own answers, and then address the questions raised during the previous round. Sometimes, as we know, when you gather a big group of experts into one room, one person's reputation or the way that they act or speak might influence the conversation in many ways. So the Delphi method removes that influence in this way, best ideas can rise to the top. However, Delphi studies are now often used to generate consensus among a group of experts around a given topic. We chose a Delphi study to help us validate the threshold concept approach for information literacy instruction and to define the threshold concepts for information literacy because threshold concepts are typically identified by subject experts. Delphi studies have been used by librarians and information professionals in a lot of different areas. A Delphi study actually contributed to the early definition of the term information literacy, and this technique has been successfully used since then to understand various aspects of the information literacy landscape. As you may have anticipated, Delphi studies are a huge time com commitment for participants. Our study went for a year and four different rounds. So, as you can imagine, we are hugely grateful to the participants for agreeing to work with us on this. We recruited a group of 19 information literacy experts. We asked them three questions with the overall objective of the study to discover whether a group of experts think threshold concepts would be useful, 
and if they are, to identify the information literacy threshold concept. This is the first question we asked. So the first answer that we received to the general question, do TCs have potential for IL instruction, was resolved after round one. The answer was a resounding yes. Here's our second question. And finally, we asked, based on your expertise with information literacy instruction, do you have any additional threshold concepts to propose? So what are the threshold concepts for information literacy defined by the Delphi study? Before we go through the list, a couple of big caveats. Please note that we are still evaluating the data from round four, and there may be some changes, if not to the list of threshold concepts we're sharing today, certainly to the descriptions. Additionally, this list is not exhaustive. The goal of the Delphi study was to identify genuine threshold concepts for information literacy, big ideas that meet the criteria set forth by Meyer and Land. However, the goal was not to identify any and all threshold concepts for information literacy. That caveat bears repeating. This list is preliminary and subject to change. We are going to start with the first threshold concept we ever identified even before the Delphi study. And so for this first concept, we're going to spend a bit more time explaining the context of the concept so you can see how we came to identify it. Okay, so for that, we're going to go back to me. And uh, this concept has actually been a little bit controversial, and uh, it was a part of the ACRL uh, information literacy framework, but they've changed it a little bit at this point. But we're still going to talk about it. So it's format. So format, to my mind, is a really great example of something that we as librarians use to understand the world in which we work and something that outsiders really kind of have vague notions about. And the word itself is troublesome. It has multiple everyday meanings that students will bring with them. And this is quite common for a threshold concept. For example, a limit in mathematics or opportunity cost in economics. Those are words that we understand in this everyday sort of way, but in the disciplinary context, they have very particular meanings. So this threshold concept came about because a student emailed me this question. Uh, and to a librarian, this question makes no sense. They emailed it to me in about eight weeks into a 10-week uh, information literacy course, a credit-bearing course. And at first I was confused by his confusion. I was mystified because I thought we had covered this material. I had spent time in class talking about formats. We had looked at the print versions of various formats and the students had filled in uh, tables with characteristics of scholarly versus popular formats. But I clearly hadn't addressed something fundamental about formats. So I'm going to go back to Google and do a search. So this is a search for happiness. Now, this is generally how I see a list of search results. <laughs> now, I, this is my librarian eyes, and your own librarian eyes may differ. But generally, when we see a results list like this, we see formats. And beneath those formats, we understand that there are processes for information creation and dissemination. And we make judgments about the usefulness of these various sources as evidence. And so this is how an information expert sees this list. So let's take a look at how a novice sees this list. Now, this may be a bit of an exaggeration, but we know that our students come to us, they may have certain associations with websites like Wikipedia. You know, they don't necessarily understand the difference between these different formats. So they think Wikipedia is good for starting their research, and they miss this fundamental understanding about format. So the next slide is going to have a basic definition of format, and I'm going to let you read that. So with this definition, we're shifting the focus from 
the end format, like newspaper, journal article, congressional hearing, blog, to the pattern of events which produces the information. Now, if you do that, you're shifting the focus of the beginner, and they can't go back to seeing it the old way, because the expert is asking critical questions about a source, and they're informed by this very basic understanding of how and why it was produced and disseminated. We also understand that format doesn't mean how the source looks or how the information is experienced, but refers to this underlying process that created the source. Whoops. Yeah. So we're shifting. So those who understand this concept know when it is appropriate to use different types of sources. This concept also de-emphasizes this increasingly irrelevant distinction between print versus online sources. And it looks at content creation rather than how that content is delivered or experienced. And that's always going to be in flux. So while the relevance of the physical characteristics of various formats has waned with the increasing availability of digital networked information, understanding format is still an essential part of evaluating information. And before we move on to talking about the other threshold concepts, I want to emphasize that difference between the novice and expert ways of knowing and practicing, because the novice to expert continuum, continuum is one of my favorite aspects of threshold concepts, and it can really help us when teaching and assessing conceptual knowledge. So for the five remaining concepts, we're going to give a brief description of each concept. So the next one is authority. So we call upon authoritative evidence in different ways depending on the information need. And we recognize that a single voice is rarely sufficient to support a claim or refute an argument, to make a decision, to inspire creativity, to inform an opinion, or even to generate a new inquiry. However, the evidence needed and the way the evidence is evaluated and used depends entirely on the context in which the information need arises. Consequently, the disciplines have differing views of what constitutes evidence, and differing situations give rise to different criteria for the evaluation of authority, whether acknowledged or implicit. Understanding the concept of authority highlights how critical evaluation skills have become more important than knowledge of specific and trusted sources. On the one hand, all sources are not created equal and authoritative voices do exist for specific categories of knowledge. But on the other hand, authority is a reflection of societal structures of power reproduced through established systems and institutions, such as peer review, editorial processes, scholarly presses, and institutions of higher education. A rigid view of authority can result in privileging certain sources of information unjustly, likewise relying only on established expertise may exclude potentially helpful sources of information that are not generally recognized by the structures that confer authority. So the next threshold concept is information goods. And I think in our first paper, this was the information as a commodity threshold concept. So this concept acknowledges and identifies the relationship between information and the economic systems that produce, reproduce, and disseminate information. So this allows researchers to better negotiate the complicated territory of information value, intellectual property, and sociopolitical issues related to information. Experts understand the economy of information manifests itself throughout the research process, whether accessing, citing, or using information. The shift from a landscape of information scarcity to one of information abundance has changed the value proposition for information. So the expert understands the value of the information they create and use, and does both with consideration for the laws and ethics of intellectual property. They also acknowledge the power of money to exert influence on what and how information is produced, how widely it is disseminated, and how it impacts civil society. And this is true on issues as varied as the increasing commodification of personal information to government approaches to various sociopolitical issues, such as climate change and privacy, to the marginalization of certain voices within the systems that produce and disseminate information. So now we're going to take a look at information structures. 
opening the hood on databases and search engines transforms them from mysterious boxes that magically produce good enough information on command into logical systems that can be used precisely and effectively. Databases and other search tools are themselves part of a loosely structured landscape of information storage systems. Understanding how search tools work and what they contain can empower users to not only access information from these different systems, but also to apply this principle to share and use data effectively. Boolean operators, search filters, and field searching are advanced features that illuminate the structures underlying the search interface and help researchers understand that searching is not magic. Rather, information is structured and we can leverage these structures when we search. At the same time, expert researchers consider the findability of the information and data that they contribute to various environments. This concept extends from personal information management to using metadata standards for the gathering of research data into repositories. Next, I want to talk about the research process as a threshold concept. This addresses the research process as characterized by iterative inquiry. Its practical purpose is to solve problems or answer questions. Identifying and articulating useful questions requires an existing foundation of knowledge and is difficult intellectual work. The expert realizes that engaging in information creation process is an extension of the thinking process. Applying information to a problem or using it as evidence in an argument or for inspiration in something creative promotes understanding, but it also requires that the researcher understand the nature of disciplinary evidence. This process of inquiry, research, and use is iterative. And next, we're going to look at scholarly discourse. Information users and creators are a part of an ongoing conversation in which new knowledge builds upon or refutes what came before and in turn inspires others. Once this concept is grasped, instead of searching for discrete research that proves a point or solves a problem or answers a question, researchers search for conversations that they want to join. Moreover, scholarly conversation and knowledge creation are not reserved for experts alone, but rather take place in the context of a community. A basic step towards this concept, then, is the realization that citation has a function beyond the stick purpose of avoiding plagiarism. At a more advanced level, writing a literature review demonstrates awareness of the existing strands of scholarly conversation already happening around a topic. The metaphor of scholarship as a conversation implies that these processes take place in the context of a community. Generally speaking, communities uphold standards and exert influence on the content produced within those guidelines. But communities can have difficulty in negotiating new standards or shared understandings and may sometimes silence dissenters. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about the different threshold concepts that were identified in our Delphi study, and I'm going to make a little bit of a connection between those and the new ACRL framework for information literacy. So the new ACRL framework engages with the theory of threshold concepts, and it uses that theory to identify big ideas or core concepts in information literacy. And there's actually a definition of big ideas uh, popularized by Wiggins and McTeague, who wrote the book Understanding by Design, which is a fantastic book. And I'm going to give you a little chance to read this. So threshold concepts are another way of conceptualizing these core concepts. So this way of seeing our content stands in contrast to viewing it as a set of skills. And so I think you may find yourself objecting that threshold concepts are an attempt to make something out of nothing, and maybe to speak about what we teach in terms that make it sound fancier or more complex than it actually is. 
Uh, you may even see what we teach students is very straightforward, uh, relatively easy. And when we did bibliographic instruction, students could get by with a basic understanding of how to use the library. However, the landscape has shifted and the information, all information, no longer lives largely in the library. It's out there roaming the wilds of the internet. It's, we've got self-published alongside prestigious and authoritative blogs alongside questionable academic journals. So really, how does the novice distinguish between just the bad and the good or even the relevant versus the irrelevant in such an environment? So the answers no longer lie solely in the carefully cataloged shelves of the library. So we have to venture beyond the details of controlled vocabularies and step-by-step -step library catalog searches into the concepts that also make sense of information systems outside the library. So out in the world where finding, using, and creating information actually happens. These abstractions may at first sound overly complex or vague or difficult, but they are an attempt to bring together and make sense of a bunch of related smaller understandings and skills. And they're trying to simplify even though they're not easy. So though we hopefully teach students skills, the only way for those skills to make the transition from library systems to the rest of the world is to teach the associated concepts as well. And I've got a quote from Wiggins and McTeague about that very thing. So the framework uses the theory of threshold concepts as a jumping off point to identify some big ideas in our field. And it's hoped that by focusing our teaching and curriculum design efforts on these big ideas, we can develop information literate students. The big ideas in the framework began with early results from our Delphi study from round one and were modified based on the knowledge and expertise of the task force members. So the frames do not match the results of our Delphi study, nor are they all necessarily threshold concepts, but they are big ideas for our field as identified by a group of experts and practicing librarians. So the structure of the framework, it is composed of six frames, and each frame consists of three basic parts. So they each represent a big understanding but they go beyond the big understanding and they lay out knowledge practices and dispositions for each understanding. The knowledge practices are ways that students can demonstrate their understanding of a concept. So these are specific things that we can expect students to be able to do or understand related to the big idea. And I think it's understood by the task force that you may identify more knowledge practices for a given frame depending on your local con text and the priorities that you've set in that context. So for example, we're going to take a look at the most recent iteration of what used to be known as the format as a process frame and is now the information creation as a process frame. And this is actually uh, unpublished at the moment. So this is a draft of the new uh, frame description. So you can see that the description is different. It's getting at the same core understanding as the format threshold concept. Not all of the frames match up with the threshold concepts identified in the Delphi study, but this one is pretty close. So now I want to look at a few of the knowledge practices, which can really be characterized as learning objectives. They're, they're very similar, not exactly the same, but similar. So this is again for the information creation as a process frame. So Sylvia is going to talk about several activities related to this frame and to the format threshold concept. The specific objectives for each activity may vary, but you'll see how they clearly deal with several of these knowledge practices. So now we're going to look at the element of dispositions. And here are a couple of the dispositions for the format frame, information creation as a process frame. 
So I think this difference between dispositions and knowledge practices has been confusing for some folks. And really, the dispositions are about attitudes or habits of mind that students bring with them. So they re represent the affective side of the big idea, how the student should best approach a particular understanding. And you can see that here, the first one encourages students to slow down and be patient and deliberate. And the second one asks them to work on getting more comfortable in that gray zone, the not the black, not white, but the gray area, which is something that many threshold concepts deal in. And the gray zone is complex and requires knowledge to navigate successfully, but that's actually where students advance their understanding. So how do threshold concepts and the new framework look in real life? Thanks for the handoff, Laurie. <laughs> so the value of a theoretical framework is immense. Working with new theories can inspire, challenge, and shift our thinking. Though this may not be true for every discipline, and I don't purport to speak for all of them, I would argue that our pedagogical theory is most valuable when we use it in the classroom in order to improve student learning. So let's talk about the sorts of things we can do to put threshold concepts into practice. Threshold concepts acknowledge that students come to us with varying levels of prior knowledge. Learners do not start a course in the same place nor do they learn at the same pace. We're talking about whether they've gone through a peer revision process in their English class, so they can compare it to the academic practice of peer review. We're talking about whether they were ever in a science fair and wrote a hypothesis about how plants grow better when they listen to classical music, and whether they can link a hypothesis to the thesis they're writing for their research paper. We're even talking about whether a student has ever had a internet connection at home. So how does this translate to instructional design? Of course we don't throw out the research paper or the lab report or even the low stakes knowledge check quiz. All of those things still have value, but we can use other activities that tell us where students are. For example, we can ask learners to journal their progress through the course, to make an infographic or concept map for a theory, or carry out verbal interviews about the course content. Here, you're seeing the result of a brainstorming session where my class practiced coming up with keywords as a part of developing their own research questions. This isn't an enormous change from current practice. It could be as simple as showing that they understand that not everything you find on the web is a website or being able to give their own example of how two formats are different from one another, or drawing a picture of the difference between the open web and a database. Showing progress is going to look different for everyone because our students start out with very different backgrounds and
person might have her hand on the handle. When the learner is introduced to a threshold concept for the first time, she might walk right through because she's had exposure to similar ideas, or she was given an example to which she could relate. She's already right there. Others may take twice as long because they're several blocks away from the door or because they stop to get a coffee. Still others walk around in a circle for a bit or sit down in the same place for three months. When we're teaching a 60 minute library instruction session, it's going to be difficult to know where our students are in terms of their prior knowledge. One of our favorite tools for quickly gauging where our students are in their understanding is an audience polling tool called Poll Everywhere. Poll Everywhere allows students to answer a question using either their cell phone or a computer. Here, you're seeing responses from a group of first year students in a one-time library instruction class where I asked, hey, what makes a source scholarly? These results tell me that not only are students confused about the term scholarly, they're also confused about what constitutes a source. From here, we made a list of source types, newspapers, books, magazines, radio interviews, documentaries, movies, and so on. And then we looked at that list and we talked about which of those formats could be scholarly, which could be popular, or what might be both. You can also see here that some students use the poll to respond to other moments in the session, which is why there's someone asking, uh, can a blog be a source? Later, I mentioned that as City University of New York students, they would all have free access to a digital subscription to the New York Times, which usually costs about 200 American dollars. That's when another student commented, that's expensive. Though these responses may seem to indicate otherwise, when this class walked in, they were shy and they were resistant. Every question I asked was met with silence and then more silence until I introduced the poll. There was something useful, something powerful about having a safe and low stakes place to say, I don't know. Still, as I mentioned, and as we all know, not all classes show up to their library instruction session in the same place. Here, you're seeing the responses I got from a different group of first year students. I can tell from their responses that most of them know that peer review and scholarly journal are the right answers. The fact that this one phrase is coming from everyone, though, tells me that I can start pushing on those answers to get at questions about authority and about scholarly discourse. I ask things like, what do you look for when you're checking a classmate's writing? And what percentage of journal articles do you think are rejected every year? I ask, is a Yelp review written by a food expert and a famous chef a scholarly source? And is Tylenol CEO an expert on pain relief medicine. But is she a good source of information if she tells you that Tylenol is the best pain relief medicine? I attempt to contextualize their answers and build on what they already know. Now we are looking at the same question posed to students in my semester long research strategies course. Their responses tell me that Hooray, most of them did the assigned reading, but that they may have some complicated ideas about the relationship between opinion and scholarship. With this class, I called on students to define the components of authorial expertise and to separate commentary from analysis statements. I asked questions like, does the value of a source change depending on who is reading it? And what is the difference between an opinion and an argument? The what makes a source scholarly question pairs well with an activity created by Kevin Sieber, who is the library instruction coordinator and government documents librarian at Colorado State University Pueblo. When we teach students about different formats, we typically rely on visual cues. Literally, we bring in a journal, and we bring in a book, and we bring in a newspaper and a magazine, and we say, look, they look different. They look 
different. We point out how the journal article looks different from the magazine article, looks different from a newspaper article, or we tell students to look for that scholarly, academic, or peer review box in the database. Increasingly, though, this kind of instruction is going to fall short. How can we ask students to look for dense type, editorial boards, or the presence or absence of advertisements when the same exact article from Psychology Today looks so different in print, online, and when retrieved from a library database? Kevin Seaver's activity shifts the conversation about formats away from questions about graphic design and toward something more conceptual. In my adaptation of his activity, I put students into three groups, and each of them is given a stack of index cards. Each group is assigned a process, like research needed to support argument, time to write, and ease to read. Their stacks of cards are labeled with different format types, like Facebook status or tweet, Wikipedia article, blog entry, newspaper article, scholarly journal article, and scholarly book. Students are asked to rank the format types based on the process. So for example, what takes longer to write, a Wikipedia article or a blog entry? What's easier to read, a tweet or a book? Once the groups finish putting the format types in order, I ask the students to report back on where they disagreed or where they were not certain about the answer. One student pointed out that when she writes blog entries for her English class, she has to use a ton of sources and it takes forever. Probably longer, she argued, than the Wikipedia article about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Another student said that a scholarly math article was way more difficult to read than your average book. I also used this activity to talk about things like primary and secondary sources or the information life cycle in general. How does the way that information is gathered, analyzed, and delivered change the way that we use it? Since most students are going to put tweets and Facebook statuses as the easiest to read, the quickest to write, and created without much background research, I then ask them, can you think about a time when a Facebook status or tweet would be useful? And then there's silence, and then more silence. So then I ask, OK, where did you hear about the protests happening in Hong Kong? And they say, Facebook and my friend on WhatsApp. And I say, where did you find out about Robin Williams passing away? And they say, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. We've had success with this activity in both one-time and semester-long library instruction sessions. It takes about 20 minutes to complete from giving instructions to being finished. And it encourages students to understand that the substance of format lies in the processes of information creation, production, and dissemination that underlie the sometimes more visible structures, such as its presentation, availability in print or online, and so on. Finally, I want to share the assignment I paired with some of the above activities in my credit course. In this assignment, students choose a classic or acclaimed movie like Star Wars or Casablanca, and they have to find both a popular and a scholarly review. They fill in a chart that compares the characteristics of the two reviews. Who is the audience? What are the author's credentials? What is its purpose? Students then write a paragraph where they use specific examples from the reviews to compare and contrast the scholarly and popular sources. This assignment gets at the format threshold concept, but also the authority threshold concept. It aims to help students understand that Different situations give rise to different criteria for the evaluation of authority, whether acknowledged or implicit. A historian writing about gender in Disney movies is probably not going to help you decide what you're going to watch this weekend, just as a critic writing in variety might not be the best place to find a source for your paper about the movie adaptations of Jane Austen's novel. Ultimately, we want students to see that authority is a reflection of societal structures of power reproduced through established systems and institutions.
This may sound a bit heady for an assignment about movie reviews, but it at least introduces the idea that context is an essential part of authority. There is another piece to these activities and assignments. They are fun. Here, I'm showing you an example that I prepared in order to teach my students about concept mapping. I asked students to join me in a Google Doc and to practice creating shapes and changing the information, and I gave them time to explore and play with the tool. This is what my concept map looked after five minutes. They destroyed my concept map, but they definitely, definitely had fun. After practicing, students working in groups were asked to create a concept map titled Finding, Choosing, and Using Information. Here's what one of the groups created. This was amazing. So I set up Google Docs for every group, but I only gave them the title of their map finding, choosing, and using information. Everything else that you see here was the product of their imagination and their organization. This tells me so much about the way that these students understood the concept introduced so far and about the connections that they were making from week to week. This is a new assignment, and I'm still waiting for the other groups to turn in their math, so I'm going to hold off on elaborating on this until I have a better sense of how it worked for the other students in the course. I share this, though, to give you an example of how working with threshold concepts has changed completely the way that I teach. This was fun for our students, but it was even more fun for me. Certainly, it was more fun than the multiple choice exam I would have written instead. Planning out an assignment that would capture real student learning that would require analysis and synthesis rather than reporting was challenging, energizing, and exciting. Here you're seeing some friendly tuxedo cats on the cusp of their own threshold. When I was first introduced to threshold concepts, I was completely overwhelmed by how much it raised the stakes. I have a difficult enough time covering library services and resources in an hour. And now I'm going to teach students how to interrogate the contextual underpinnings of their information world. It's a lot. <laughs> As I worked with this theory, however, I found that engaging with threshold concepts is less about trying to teach six complex concepts in one class and more about shifting my priorities. My objective moved from help students define articles that take a pro-con stance on a current event to frame topic development as the first step of a research process in which inquiry leads to the creation of new knowledge. Still, a shift toward conceptual teaching does not mean that 20 students cross the threshold in one hour. Instead, I use that one hour to invite students to approach, if not cross the threshold. When I get near a threshold concept with a student, I remind myself, hey, you're planting a seed. I'm introducing the threshold, maybe helping it come into view, but we're going to circle back over many times until the student finally does cross through and experiences an aha moment. Engaging with threshold concepts develops a community of practice around a better understanding of student learning. It gives us a chance to talk about where we all struggle, and it destigmatizes the experience of not getting something right away. It acknowledges the individual student and librarian as subject matter expert. In our experience, shifting the focus from skill-based training to conceptual teaching has been energizing and it's been stimulating. And that's a non-quantifiable benefit but it's one that contributes to sustainable teaching. Threshold concepts and reflective teaching can also reveal the nature of the content we teach, the underlying complexity. What we're trying to teach students is not simple. You can see how something that seems obvious to us as librarians, for example, that you can track down the source of the information you read, 
might actually be really troublesome. But this also means it's potentially transformative. Reflective teaching is something that we can do together. Our particular group of co-authors is proof that it can be done across institutions with different academic missions. We believe that there is a lot of room for everybody here, and we want to invite all of you to be co-investigators as we work to develop this emerging theory. Thank you. Okay, so um, are you ladies done with your presentation? Yes, thank you. Okay, so what is going to happen now is we are going to open up the floor to questions. Um, Sylvia, I just, I don't know if you we saw are. the chat that while you were talking. <laughs> um, there's been a number of questions about some of the assignments. Um, they wanted you to share a few more details. Um, so does anyone have any specific questions that maybe Sylvia could answer about? Um, okay, so Jorge would like to mm -hmm. see uh, the sources again. So do you guys want to specifically look at any of the assignments that Sylvia looked at? Oh, sure. <laughs> do you just want to elaborate a little? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Great. <laughs> you know, I can talk a little bit about how I transition yeah, yeah, sure. I can talk a little bit about how I trans transition from the format activity into a larger discussion and a database transition, um, database demonstration. So I recently had a class where um, the assignment was to examine a crime and the way that it was reported upon. So a lot of the students in this class were criminal justice majors. And so they were going to be primarily using uh, LexisNexis and looking for both historical documents as well as current reporting. So in this case, they were looking at a, um, uh, they were referred to as the Central Park Five, but they were accused of uh, attacking and raping a jogger uh, in Central Park. Many years later, decades later, after a documentary and a great deal of investigation, including forensic evidence, they were cleared completely, all five members of um, the initial accused group of the crime, and they were all found innocent. So that was one example of the way that the reporting may have changed from when the crime actually happened in the 1980s until their exoneration. So I started by talking about, um, I used the format activity to say that the way that an event might be reported upon in a newspaper or um, in a tweet on the day that it happened is going to be something that shifts as time moves on. And after the activity, I showed them the information lifecycle chart that said, okay, what happens days after an event? What happens weeks after an event? And over here, years later, big bird's eye view of the event, you've got the books and you've got the scholarly articles. And so with that context, I then moved them into a search for date-limited newspaper articles, as well as current writings about that event, and even the way that the Central Park, Central Park Five was referred to in common conversation. So um, a similar crime happens in Texas, and they refer to the New York crime as an example. So I was able to start with a big conceptual great, conversation and then transition we have a, into a database demonstration to that, that brought them to the newspaper if you can sources talk a little that they bit were trying about, to find. Uh, more about assessment in this activity. Sure. So in that case, we aren't really assessing each of the one-shot sessions because they're only in here uh, for one hour in a semester, and I probably teach anywhere between you know 13 and 20 classes. But as a program, the library does uh, do a selection of classes to do both pre-test and pro-test, and all of the teaching librarians at my institution try to address a shared list of teaching objectives. So. Uh, being able to understand Boolean searching, um, awareness of library sources, 
and distinction between popular and scholarly sources and you know knowledge of library databases as a preferred source of information and so students are asked about a really quick short survey before they have the library instruction so maybe 20 classes out of the 200 classes that are taught in one semester are given the pre-survey and then 20 classes are given the same survey after library instruction out of the 200 classes and we've been able to chart a well a, a, a statistically significant difference um, between the success of students in answering those questions in the pre versus the post groups. But and, and we're, <laughs> I was just going to say we're starting to work on assessment mm -hmm. here as well and one of the things that I think uh, has been most challenging about talking to folks about using threshold concepts and the new framework in teaching is the one-shot dilemma. And, and I think that this is actually the, this is the first uh, semester that uh, we as a group, uh, the, the four of us, have been trying to incorporate threshold concepts into our one-shot teaching. And we came across that wonderful activity from Kevin Sieber, the format activity, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, we had already been using poll everywhere with one of the favorite questions being what makes a source scholarly to just start engaging them with that question of format. But what we're doing at the University of New Mexico, which I think is something that a lot of people are doing, is we're flipping the curriculum. And so we teach a ton of those English 120 classes, they're English 100, 1A, whatever they're called at different institutions, and I'm sure a lot of us do that. And what we've done is we've moved a bunch of sort of tutorials and, and including a little conceptual piece on format into an online environment using Qualtrics. And so when they come to class then, they've already completed this hour-long tutorial which has given them an introduction to format and has given them an introduction to using some of the tools that we normally database demo in the class. And so what we're hoping to do then is to take the information we're gathering from that Qualtrics to see if student learning is actually happening, like if they're actually getting format. Because after the format conceptual piece, then there's a little quiz, it's more of a knowledge check for understanding, but when we come to class, then if they do the Kevin Sieber activity, if they do some sort of activity, we have a discussion about format, it's a little more meaningful because we're actually getting into some deeper material that they've already been introduced to. So I think the flipping the curriculum is sort of a way to kind of enrich the one shots and maybe give us a little bit more time and with did students you guys create this and give us time to work on those conceptual ideas, those big ideas, as opposed to doing the database demos, which, I mean, to be fair, I think is useful information. And I will mention that when we. So, uh, to answer. You mean the Sorry, to answer Angie's question really quick, it's Kevin Sieber, and he's at Colorado State University yeah, Pueblo, yeah. and he does have a website. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, Lori, do you want to talk about the creation of all of this? Oh, you mean the, the when you ask, do we create, oh, um, I actually used uh, as a model, I, I based it on a presentation that I saw at a conference from a librarian out of Kansas. And she had created a tutorial. And the only thing that I really changed was that I added in a little bit about format. Uh, and like I said, a little presentation about format and introduction. And then everything else was, I think, pretty much what we all teach, like you know, topic development, identifying keywords for searching, searching strategies. Um, there was a little bit about citation, mostly just how do you generate an automatic citation using a database, um, resources for you know, correcting those automatically generated citations, just that kind of thing. And I mean, I think that at the first year level, we're talking about introducing them to what the library is about and making sure that they know us and like us and that we're warm and friendly people who really want to help them and and that we can just kind of get going on the threshold concepts. And I think that in my mind, the threshold concepts, they will encounter these in you. later classes in we had a disciplinary question, classes once uh, they get into their is, majors. Is adaptive and that's learning a way students to learn the threshold concepts? Big ideas and bigger concepts. So I think that 
it it is if you treat me as the computer, right? <laughs> so I think, um, and I may need to broaden my definition, but my understanding of adaptive um, learning is typically when you know a computer program or um, other software responds to the way that a student is answering a question to sort of shift the learning. And that's a little bit of you know what I think we all do in the classroom on the spot. And absolutely, that is the idea behind the Poll Everywhere question. Because when we're working with students once in their semester, you can see that one class might come in having had extensive classroom discussions about the nature of reputable information or scholarly information. And another group comes in knowing that they have to find six or seven sources for their paper, but having no idea what constitutes a source, let alone what's a scholarly one. And so I adjust my teaching based on that conversation. And likewise, you know, I recently uh, used a video that was addressing street harassment in a course. And based on the way that students were responding to that video and sort of their own experiences of street harassment on the streets of New York City, I was able to sort of adjust the way that I would lecture or you know guide the conversation. And I think that's really, really crucial to applying a conceptual approach. You have to sort of tease out where there is confusion and where there is understanding and build on it. So for instance, in the class where everyone knew the right answer was peer review, I'm able to go a lot further with that conversation um, I actually have than I am personal when question. I have to stop to explain uh, what a source to, is uh, and how you use your information. Delphi study, I was wondering how you selected the information literacy experts. We did a literature search. We just did a search for information literacy or um, there were specific keywords we used, information literacy or something to do with research in WorldCat and in uh, the two library and information studies databases. I think there's one from EBSCO and, and I forget where the other one is from. And we looked for people who had published uh, <clears throat> extensively uh, we actually, in the first searching, we turned up a lot of library school professors. <clears throat> so we also made sure to try and get a good mix of people who were publishing but were also practitioners, and um, as well as academics. Interesting, uh, and so everyone happily basic. agreed to participate. Uh, most of the people that we invited, we did not know personally. <laughs> we just did that search and got a big list and invited a bunch of people. So. We uh, we invited a lot of people. We got about 20 participants. <laughs> we, we, we were actually, we were like, we need a, probably like between 10 and 12 is where we were aiming because in other Delphi studies that we had reviewed, that typically was enough people. But um, we, I think in the first round, we had 24 except, but I think 19 actually participated. And then after that, I think it settled in at around like 12 or 13 in each preceding round that participated. And people would like skip around and then come back. And, and um, some people went throughout the whole thing. So it was very basic. There was no real magic in, in um, inviting people. There were, the other Thank thing you. we did also is we actually we looked at the leadership question. of various um, information literacy uh, and groups. And that is how many sessions you normally have with a class? Leadership. So that was just I think we're website. discussing one shots here. Right, so it's actually a variety. So in my part of the presentation, I'm actually talking about a combination of um, some students that I see one time uh, in the course of a semester. Sometimes, however, the faculty members do ask for a follow-up session, and so I might see them twice. And then additionally, I do also teach a one-credit library um, internet research strategies course. And so with those students, I see them the same, you know, over the course of the semester, once a week, so 13 total sessions. Typically, we see students for one session. Uh, some of the English 102 instructors do come in for two. Uh, usually when they do that, they want to come in for one session where there's teaching, and then the next session is uh, a lab session 
where the librarian is mainly there to do one-on-one -on -one reference style help. Uh, although that actually happened even though we flipped it this semester and students were doing an hour of work beforehand, some of the instructors still chose to have them come in for two sessions. I think just to give the students the, the time with the librarian so that they would uh, have expert help if they needed it. We also have a credit course. Uh, it's an upper division course. We actually, here at UNM, we have an academic department that lives in the library. And one of the courses that we teach that's a part of that academic department is taught by librarians. And it's an information management for professionals course. It's uh, designed for juniors and seniors. And it's a three credit course. And mm -hmm. the librarians take turns teaching it. And so that for that course, it's a 16 week long regular course. And it, it, it really is really nice to have a we have another course question, um, where you get to spend a ton about, of time with students uh, talking about a lot of these big library, ideas uh, because it's, it's hard in the one-shot environment. Generally. And if you guys have experience with those, and I would like to add to that, if you do have experience, have you um, inserted the threshold concepts into these sessions? Well, we typically do uh, presentations to faculty for especially the new faculty orientation. And we talk about, yes, library e-resources and services with them. And then, of course, most of that we're ex except, um, expecting our subject librarians yeah. to handle on a regular basis. Uh, but we do regularly present on that for faculty. And wait, what was the second part you asked about? Oh, oh. threshold concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's funny because at my, um, the institution that I was at before this, I regularly did faculty development workshops and we did do one on threshold concepts. And here I will talk with individual faculty members about it, but I haven't done anything formal like through faculty development. I don't know if you have, Sylvia. That's my experience as well. And I will say that in the interest of not, you know, spending an hour filling their brains with a new theory, typically what I will do is when speaking with a faculty member prior to their library visit, I'll say, so I can definitely tell you about how to find books, and I can tell you about how to figure out the databases, but do you think your class would you know, benefit from a activity interrogating the structure of information? <laughs> and you know they are receptive, faculty. And recently, um, actually today, I'm teaching a class where the faculty member requested you know, a database demonstration because her students were about to start a research project. And I said, that's great. Have you talked about you know, scholarly versus popular sources? Or would you like to sort of discuss format as a factor in selecting sources? And she thought about it. She's like, yes, I would. So on a small scale, I do do an elevator pitch for this kind of conceptual teaching. And I've found that faculty members are generally receptive because if they're going to be in the room, you know, they want to be entertained too, and they usually find it productive. <laughs> I, I have to agree with Sylvia's approach. It, it, it's one of the things that I've been doing is, as you go along, you, you, um, the normal thing they'll do is they'll ask for the database demo and the tour of services and, and whatever they're used to. And then when you respond, it's like, well, we can do that. We can also talk about this kind of concept. And in fact, this semester, we had a um, an sociological research methods class, and it was a um, senior level course working on a big research project using variables from this large survey that they conduct every year here in the United States, the General Social Survey. And we came into class, and we did, <laughs> I co-taught this with a librarian, and we did the usual like database demo kind of thing. But what we did was we started with one of those poll everywheres, and we asked the students, what variables are you using for your research? Or what is your topic? And the responses that we got were so general and vague that the professor then asked us to do a session on topic development. And that's where we really brought in that research process, the nature of inquiry, solving a problem. We did a bunch of in-class exercises where we asked them to come up with problems based on variables. And that was really successful. And it was so successful that the professor was like, we're going to start with that next time, and then we're going to do another session. So we, we got two sessions out of it. 
So um, I think I really, that introducing really this kind of conceptual response. orientation we have another uh, can surprise faculty that, members. And most how do you engage a, faculty? Um, and this is the million dollar question, so we can't wait to hear what you have to say. <laughs> we have an overall problem getting faculty work with librarians, huh? Uh, Sylvia? So, you could well, I, I will say that I have to give credit where credit is due, and I do have um, a coordinator of instruction and other instruction librarians who are really great at going to department meetings and showing up at the campus curriculum committees and really advocating for the library. And I do enjoy being at an institution where the higher level administration does consider librarians to be a crucial part of the campus environment. And here at LaGuardia Community College and under the City University of New York scope, librarians are considered faculty. And when a student addresses me and when another faculty member speaks with me, it's by the title of professor. So I think that seeing the librarians as equals in this environment absolutely does immediately start a conversation because it's not about passing off their class to babysitters for an hour, but rather you know, engaging them with a guest speaker who is an expert in their own right. And so that is an advantage that I find very, I'm very grateful to have. But that being said, I think that what's been really, really productive is you know faculty speak to each other they they gossip and so when they come to the library and we do a really fun and interactive and big questions kind of session then i start to hear from other faculty and i start to you know get specific requests to work with me and I start to hear from faculty a little earlier than you know I would have otherwise instead of getting an assignment a day before or not at all you know I start to hear from faculty who want to talk about what they're working on in their class and what they've read recently I always ask for the syllabus and for the assignment and as much as possible try to refer to what they've read recently use examples drawn from the course because I think when the faculty see that we are investing our time and energy into that process they're responsive to it and so I don't think Lori and I have done anything on a big programmatic level but that kind of grassroots infiltration into the department has been effective and I would so I think and so I'm actually kind of curious about the the problem getting faculty to work with librarians is it is it about getting them to even request a library instruction session is is that what the issue is um, because my personal opinion about working with faculty is that they are really really busy and they do not really want to collaborate with librarians but if you offer them something awesome they will be more than happy to accept it so if you get their syllabus and the assignment and you know you ask them for that but then they come into the library and they simply get the the typical database demo they're just going to be like yeah that's what the library does but if you get the syllabus and assignment and you look at what the students are working on you ask some questions about the kind of big concepts that you're interested in covering uh, you maybe push back a little bit with them about they want a, you to cover 10 things and you say well I could cover two things really well if we want to do more than that you might want to schedule another session and it actually takes being a little bit bold with them and I think it's kind of hard for us as librarians at least it's hard for me personally because I feel like I'm a service professional and I'm really proud of that I'm really proud of offering services to the faculty. We also have to view ourselves, I think, as curriculum designers and curriculum consultants and really push back a little bit with them on some of their assumptions about the library and offer them something awesome. You know, we if you come into their classroom, their students have fun, they learn cool things, they learn interesting and useful things, they're going to come back and they're going to want to work with you more. Uh, so again, the collaboration, I think that that can be very difficult. And if you get a faculty member who really wants to work with you, that's terrific. 
I just think that they're really, really busy. And so you have to really exert and exert yourself and, and come up with something cool. Um, I want to mention one other method that actually Sylvia introduced me to, and it's something that we use, we're starting to use here all the time, and it's called, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Cephalonian? The Cephalonian method. The Cephalonian method. And we're using it for orientations, but we've also started using it for conceptual things. And all it is, <laughs> and I just love this, is that you write the questions that you want students to ask on cards, you distribute that to random students as they come into the classroom. And so then when you want a student to ask a useful question, you're like, whoever has the red card, will you please ask a question? And even though that sounds kind of ridiculous, it's super helpful because when the student asks the question, they're much more interested in listening to the answer, even if it wasn't their question in the first place. Is that an accurate description of it, Sylvia? Yeah, but I think we should give some examples, right? So I've okay. used it, and I see that Megan's used it. It's really fun because, you know, it's part of, like, that threshold concept -y kind of approach. Even though we're not getting at a threshold concept, we're yeah. thinking about the way the students learn. And you know when you ask, you, like, talk for 30 minutes, and then you say, hey, does anyone have any questions? And no one ever has any questions. But now you're giving the questions that they should be asking, right? So the questions I have them ask are things like, hey, I'm really popular, and I don't know when I'm going to find time to study at the library. Is there something for me? And then I tell them about how long the library hours are. Um, or I say, um, my roommate is always listening to Justin Bieber, and I can't study. How can I get away from him? And then I tell them about group study rooms, right? Um, but Lori, you've been using it for like bigger questions too, like other than like just jokes. <laughs> well, it actually hasn't been me. It's been one of the amazing librarians I work with. She's actually been using it for big idea questions. So she actually, because we give them the uh, format concept, uh, the format, format, introduction of formats and a little video tutorial, when they come into class, she asks them, quite, she has them ask questions that relate to that, that it kind of push on these notions of formats and how you use formats. And, um, and so I'm, I'm putting together, I want to make a little database of these questions because I, I think they're really useful. And she does the same thing with the research process and topic development and, and sort of pushing back against like, well, how does topic development look for a biology topic versus um, a sociology topic, that kind of thing. And I've also done, what good are you when I have Google? Um, or, you don't have what I want. And I put it on the paper in big I also and I say, shout at librarian. To, um, so sometimes do interpretive to dances that. or uh, <laughs> a dramatic act to really engage them. And I've had some fabulous, fabulous results from that. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun because I've also, and I've tried this just one time, um, but I've had students do a tableau. So, you know, it's all about representing what's in their head, right? Um, so I say, uh, make a tableau, so freeze yourselves in place to represent you know, a Google search versus a database search. And then I leave the room for five minutes. And so they have to, like, contort themselves, you know, into, like, people yelling at each other or, like, all these people surrounding one person, um, right. sort of, like, using their body Does anyone to have any other questions? Their Time is running out. And, the and um, I'm database. sure Lori and really Sylvia would like a, a cup of coffee soon. <laughs> That's good. Um, I see someone else is just writing one thing. Um, <laughs> So we'll just I've been drinking give you guys coffee all a minute. Along, I see a few actually. people are typing in. Um, otherwise, we will Megan, wrap can I, things up. Yes. Can I interject a question? Can you guys Go hear me? Um, <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions, but, but one is um, most of the concepts that you've outlined, the threshold concepts, <laughs> relate to a, a critical understanding of the changing environment of scholarly communications, and as well as other forms of communication. And I'm wondering, um, how do those kinds of threshold concepts align us with um, and in sort of position us in relation to me media literacy and media studies and, in general, the, the scholarly and teaching domain of, of our communications faculty? 
So I, f I always feel like there's this overlap with what's I mean, the content of the, their discipline. And for certain aspects of what I want to teach students about related to what I would think of as information literacy, I feel like it really is overlapping with uh, media studies, with communication studies. Um, but I, I rarely hear people, people talking about information literacy instruction and explicitly evoking the idea of working directly with communications faculty, for example. So I'm actually the communication and journalism librarian here, and I've I've observed the same overlap. I I actually think that there is a significant overlap between the threshold concepts that we're talking about. We say information literacy threshold concepts, but they're in my mind I think of them as sort of information studies or information science threshold concepts, uh, and other disciplines. And I think that this is actually pretty common in interdisciplinary fields broadly with threshold concepts. I know that I attended one of the Threshold Concepts conferences, which they hold every other year, and it was really common for these interdisciplinary fields to struggle a little bit with feeling like there was overlap. And I know that that has been something that a lot of folks in, um, actually just a lot of librarians, period, have been concerned about, is this idea that information literacy threshold concepts may overlap with other areas, or maybe there aren't any threshold concepts for information literacy, because it does, it is so multidisciplinary, and it overlaps. But I actually think that our focus is a little bit different than the media studies folks, because they're primarily concerned with published information and particular in and news in particular and we're concerned with information very broadly with all information and in particular with human human interaction with information and these days that's largely through computers so i think we have much more of a tech emphasis as well we're interested in information systems we have things like metadata i don't think they're concerned with that and i think that that is actually part of what we should be teaching students i mean i think that that's a big part of for instance the data management movement there's all this training for data management for graduate students and data curation and part of that is really giving students an introduction to what it means to classify information <clears throat> and to offer up the kind of metadata that makes it useful and easy to find in information systems. So I agree that there is some overlap, uh, but I think that our context is a little bit different. And I also think that because we're multidisciplinary and we kind of extend into different fields, that there's going to be unavoidable overlap in a wide variety of areas. Like, for instance, the concept of authority. I mean, honestly, the sociologists are all over that. And so I don't think that it's our concept necessarily, but I do think that our awareness of it as information professionals means that we talk to the professors about them teaching it in their classes and how it relates specifically to finding, using, creating information. I'm not quite sure I answered your question, but <laughs> Sylvia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I have a quick, I have a quick example of where I think we, we may differ. So in a class that I was teaching just yesterday, uh, the topic that students were tackling were technology worlds, so techno worlds, and how that translates to identity. So you can see how absolutely that would be something that would come up in a communications course. But they were writing about it in their English class, and they were working on their topics. And so one of the things that I demonstrated is this was a popular focus for a lot of the groups in the class. They all wanted to write about social media, of course, right? And a lot of them were also interested because they were communications or business majors in advertising. So they were like, I love social media, and I want to learn about advertising. So I showed them, when you type in same terms in both places, you know, when you type in social media and advertising in Google, let's look at those results. And then you type in the same exact words, social media and advertising in a library database, what's the difference? So I asked them to take a look at the two sets of results to come to the conclusion that when you type those words into Google, you're getting results that are trying to either sell you a service or teach you how to sell something. Whereas in a library database, <laughs> the results are designed at looking at culture broadly and examining kind of the nature of our changing relationship with commerce and with, you know, the internet at large and ourselves as products, right? And so I feel like our priority in that class 
was about how to gather reputable information for your own use or for your the clarification of your research question. And so like that use component, I think maybe differs in priority than the way Thank that you. Jeff, did you have any other question? question. Mm -hmm. I, I do, <laughs> but I want. I know that we only have two minutes left, and so if someone else has a question, I'll I'll give them first uh, first chance. <laughs> well, wait a second. See if anyone else wants to ask something. You should probably just ask anyways. Well, yeah. the Go one ahead. of uh, <laughs> I'll ask one from my list here. Um, and it's sort of a, it's a really sort of going taking a step really far from the practice and going back to the, the theory, but sort of the or you know where the threshold concept idea came from, um, and the fact that it came from outside of information literacy, um, it I mean it seems like a really powerful uh, tool for reimagining information literacy, and it resonates really well with me and my uh, with my view of uh, information literacy. But I'm wondering, since this came from outside of information literacy. It, has has this model been gaining traction and uh, you know being proven useful more broadly? It just in terms of undergraduate pedagogy or in other disciplines. You started talking about that that I think, but um, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a bit. Is it something that has has you know garnered adoption and gained traction elsewhere? I think it has. It's actually been pretty wildly popular in the disciplines. They've published, uh, Meyer and Lynn have published several books, and each of the books has chapters that are from the varying disciplines. I, I think that there has been pickup, especially in more technical disciplines, where the knowledge is perhaps not um, uh, negotiated quite so much. <laughs> so in engineering, for instance, they love threshold concepts, but maybe in English literature, folks like to argue a lot more. Um, same thing in sociology and in some of the humanistic disciplines like history. So they have debated a lot about it, but in you know, more technical fields, they really like it because they see that it's a way for them to focus their curriculum, their curricular efforts, their teaching, and get students through some of these big ideas because what has been happening, and I think we all know this, is that students take a class like Econ 101 or something like that, and they come out and they don't remember any of these big ideas that we would like them to remember. And so it has been very popular. And if you do a search for threshold concepts in Google, typically one of the first results is um, a giant website full of the threshold concepts literature, a listing, a big bibliography, Nick Flanagan. And he, that has articles from all different disciplines. So it has gained a lot of traction. And I think it's being taught in a lot of faculty development. Um, that's how I learned about it in a faculty development workshop. So it's being it taught widely in the United States at this point. And I think they're actually having their next conference in North America, um, not next year, but the year after. Sylvia? I think that sums it no. up, basically. <laughs> so it has been very popular. I think, I think because uh, per, uh, higher education, folks don't want to take a bunch of classes about educational theory and pedagogy. Thank you. They, um, and um, this gives, it's a bit of a shortcut. On behalf of Amacol and all the participants shortcut, but today, I would like to thank you, both of you, Lori and Sylvia. This has been a fabulous webinar, um, and we really appreciate you waking up extra early to be with us today. Um, there's people, and I would bet, uh, well, it's 7 p.m. where I am, so some people stayed up past their bedtime, I would imagine, <laughs> just to attend this, and I think it's been really useful. Um, so on behalf of everyone, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>